This is Sword of the Spirit International Prophetic Ministries. John 15, John 15 puts it like this. It says, abide in me and I in you. Yes. You know, for the, for the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Yes. So whoever abides in me, it is he that bears much fruit. Yes. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yes. I want to paint a picture for you guys right now because whilst we were worshipping, I wasn't intending on going here, but the Holy Spirit really wanted me need to minister the importance of covenant relationship and your identity as a bride. You're not a concubine. Hallelujah. 
I do not want you, man. You're not one who he beseeches to come into his secret place, gives you a touch, and then you have to go, and then he never is going to pull you back again. You abide. Wives abide. They don't lodge in a hotel. They stay in the house of their king. And that word abide actually means remain. Stay with me. Stay with me and I will stay with you. This speaks of intimacy. This speaks of oneness. This speaks of communion. The word for this in the Greek is konyoneo. It means, you know, fellowship. It means intimacy. And think about it this way. When a, when a man and his wife goes off into the secret place, they're intimate, and they give birth. And when you look at this baby, you can see the name. The baby carries the name of the father. The baby carries the features of the father. The baby carries the DNA of the father. You know, you look at the baby, you can tell he, res he resembles his father. So when you're intimate with Christ, when you become one with him, you begin to bear fruits, but when people look at that fruit, they can see his name on it. They can see his face on it. They can see his character on it. They can see his nature in it. It actually reveals who he is. That's why John 15, 8 says, By this my Father is glorified, inasmuch that you bear fruits, and in doing so, show that you're my disciples. Because the fruit you bear actually glorifies him. So we're dealing with the glory of God. Paul was someone that saw the glory of God. Can we go into Acts chapter um, 26 from verse 12? I'll read it quick. Are you there? Yeah, some of you are there before me. <laughs> um, Acts chapter 26 verse 12. I'm going to read till verse 18. Okay, am I, am I good to read? Are we all there? Pastor Moses, if you're not there, say help me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus, Paul is basically recounting to King Agrippa here the story of his conversion. You know, how he, how he transformed. We know Paul as someone who was persecuting Christians and everything, but he had a radical encounter that transformed his life forever. Yeah? Okay, verse 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me, and them which journeyed with me. And when they were, and when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, So, so, why, per why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have prepared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance amongst them which are being sanctified by faith that is in me. Cool. So Paul has this radical encounter. But before Paul had this encounter, he was in contact, he had contact with somebody else who saw the glory of God. His name was Stephen. We know about Stephen the martyr. And Saul was actually there, because this was his old life now, he was there um, approving his murder. People actually laid their belongings, their goods, to, to, to Saul at the time, to Saul's um, side, whilst they stoned Stephen to death. But then the Bible helps us to realize that being filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen saw heaven, yeah. and he saw the glory of God. Remember, the principle to remember from 2 Corinthians 3.18 is, as you see, you become the glory. As you see, you're transformed into the glory. So because Stephen saw heaven, because he saw the glory of God, and what is what fills heaven is the glory of God, is the manifest presence of God. Because he saw the glory of God, he actually became that glory. Jesus is the glory of God. 
Hebrews puts it this way. It says he is the brightness of his glory and the exact imprint of his nature. So because Stephen saw the glory of God, he became the glory of God. So in the same way Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Stephen said, Father, do not hold this sin against them. And what better way is there to preach a gospel of forgiveness than you actually forgiving those who have offended you? What better way for you to actually demonstrate the fact that there is a king that's merciful and kind than you extending that mercy and that kindness that you've received? I'm telling you, that would do so much better to preach than you going out on the street and preaching but harboring up to hate and to offense and to, and to anger and all of those things. The reality is that when we come in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John chapter 3, he said that, if when you're born of, you need to be born of the Spirit before you can see the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the king's domain, is where he reigns, is where he rules, and that's heaven. That's God's rule. That's his domain. And when the Holy Spirit shows you heaven, you begin to see the way the things work in heaven. You begin to understand the culture, the order of heaven. You understand that, that there is no such thing as unforgiveness in heaven. There is no such thing as bitterness in heaven. There is no such thing as resent in heaven. And because you are from heaven, sent from heaven as an ambassador, you bring that kingdom culture and you use it to influence the earth. And it looks like you revealing and manifesting the life that Christ lived. But it's something amazing that the Holy Spirit showed me about this whole you know, story. It's the power that forgiving somebody can have on them. Mm-hmm. How much they can transform their lives. I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever thought Saul's conversion had something to do with Stephen's prayer? Mm-hmm. Think about it. Stephen goes, do not hold this sin against them. <laughs> and then as Saul is going to persecute more Christians, Jesus appears to him. What would happen if you were to say to God, do not hold the sin of this person persecuting me against me. Rather, reveal yourself to them. They could be the next Paul. They could be the next great missionary. They could be the next victory. They could be someone who turns the face of the earth upside down because you decided to actually release and release the, 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 the crime, the guilt, everything that is caused to you. You decided to release it. It can actually transform a life, and that's the gospel. That's literally the gospel. In the same way, Stephen encountered the glory of God. Paul actually encountered the glory of God as well. Now Jesus came and he shone as a light that blinded him. The reality is that Paul had to be blinded from his old mindset, from his old way of thinking. The Bible says in James 3.13 that the wisdom of this world, which deals with how you think, is self-seeking. It's full of, you know, bitter jealousy. It's actually earthly, sensual, and demonic because it's full of bitter jealousy and self-seeking. Now, that self-seeking nature is the reason why you would see people, you know, who need the gospel, who need the Christ that you have, but you say, no, I want to preserve myself. I want to protect myself. I don't really understand how they're going to take me, you know, so let me just preserve myself. Let me just keep myself, you know, to me. And let me, like, I don't want to annoy them. I don't want to frustrate them. And I was there as well. But the reality is when you encounter the glory of God, it changes you. It changes the way you think. You don't longer to think for yourself anymore. You know, because Paul saw the glory of God, he said in 2 Corinthians 5 that when one died, all died. He said the love of Christ actually compels me. It compels us. So we conclude that when one died, all died. And us who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who gave his life for us. And now we regard no one according to the flesh. What's he saying? I'm not going to look at you according to face value, to what to what you're showing me. I'm going to look at you according to the price that Christ paid for you. If Christ shed his blood for you, that means you're worth something. And you're worth more than you're living right now. There's so many people who are not saved. They don't have a relationship with God. They don't, they're not intimate with their maker, so they're living below their created value. You need to know the manufacturer of a thing for you to know how it works. But because they don't know Christ, 
They don't, they're, not, they're living above why they were created. But do you know how they're going to know Christ? When you manifest it. Come on. Yes. John 17 literally says that this is eternal life. That they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Yeah? That they know God. That's eternal life. But the only way that they would know God is if you make him known. It's if you glorify him. It's if you manifest him. So Christ, so Christ comes and the light blinds Paul. It changes his perspective. It changes his, his way of thinking. But then he sends one of his apostles to open his eyes. Because God wants to give him the new eyes, a new vision. Matthew 6, 22 says that the eye is the lamp of the body. And if the eye is good, if it's single, then the whole body is full of light. That means if you see clearly, if your perspective is right, then you'll be fine. You'll be good. If your mindset is good, if the way you perceive is just good, if you can see people the way the Father sees them, if you can see their value the same way the Father sees their value, if you can understand that the way Christ sees them, then it would affect the way you relate to them. You wouldn't struggle with unforgiveness anymore because you understand that, you know, whilst you were a sinner, whilst you were an enemy, Christ saw you as someone worth dying for. And because of that, you're trying to reveal who he is to the world. You're trying to express his image and his nature. You're trying to glorify him. So you're going to see people the same way he sees them, which is as people worth dying for, and you would lay down your life for them. Mm -hmm. come on, come on. The reality is that as you behold, you become the glory, yes? yes. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Jesus appears to Paul as a lie. And then he tells, he tells Paul that I'm sending you to be a light to the Gentile. Mm -hmm. He manifested himself to Paul as a light. So he's going to manifest himself through Paul as a light. So if he's a healer through you, to you, he's going to be a healer through you. If he's going to be a deliverer to you, he's going to be a deliverer through you. If he's a savior through, to you, he's going to save through you. That's how it goes. That's the reality of how it goes. But when you come into contact, into, into connection with his glory, then you start to see the different aspects of him so that you can become him. We don't read the Bible because, you know, we want to be able to quote scriptures well. And we want to, you know, be able to argue and debate with people. And, you know, we want to be people who know it all. We read the word to become it. Amen. So that we make it flesh. Amen. You know, Psalm 139 um, actually says that all your days were written in a book. It says that before before he formed your inward parts, he knew you. But before he even formed you, like his will, everything he wrote you to be, everything he thought about you to be was already written in his mind. Yes? That's, that's what the Bible says. But the reason why he's created a body is to manifest that will on earth. Because a body is what makes you relevant on earth. Yeah. So your body was made for his will. This is why you need to consecrate your body and make it an acceptable sacrifice that's pleasing unto him so that he can use that body to achieve his will on earth. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. And that speaks of you as a bride again because a body, the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. Cool. And she has to reveal who he is to the world. Yes. The same way Paul, the same way Stephen responded in forgiving you know, his enemy, the people that persecuted him, I'm dealing with this here because this is a gospel of forgiveness. Preaching by forgiving people is the way to do it. Preaching it by not harboring to offense and anger and all of those things is the way to do it. That's how to preach the gospel. Yeah. Paul and Silas, they do, Peter talks about how, first Peter talks about how, you know, we shouldn't suffer as evildoers, but we should suffer as Christians, which means suffering for doing good. Mm. Yeah? So there was, a, there was a slave woman, there was a slave woman who was, you know, just coming after Paul and Silas and talking about how they are servants of the Most High God, they are servants of the Most High God, and then she aggravated Paul, and Paul was like, you know what, you're delivered, basically, he delivered her from the, from the spirit that was afflicting her. But she used to make a lot of money for the people who owned her. And so the people who owned her were angry and they thought, you know what, he's destroyed our, our method of surplus. Like he, he, they've gotten in the way of us making more money. So they thought, let's throw Paul and Silas in jail. So they threw Paul and Silas in jail. Many of us 
if we are going out on the streets, if we are preaching the gospel, if, if, if we are doing that which God has sent us to do, if we get that same level of persecution, if we get thrown in jail, our, prob our, our response will probably be, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Like, you sent me out on the street to preach. I'm doing what you called me to do. Why can't you protect me? Why can't you keep me? Why can't you preserve me? Like, what's the point of me serving you if it's just going to get me in trouble? That's how, does that sound right? Does that sound like how a lot of people may respond? Yeah. But how did Paul and Silas respond? They worshipped. They praised because they realized that their life was no longer for themselves. But it's for he who has set them. It's for he who gave his life for them. So rather than complaining, you know, Philippians actually says that a Christian isn't supposed to complain. It says, do all things without grumbling, but shine as light in the midst of a twisted and perverse generation, which should tell us that there's something perverse about complaining. There's something twisted about complaining. It seems normal. It seems right because that's what the fall of man has taught us to see, to think that it's normal. But when we realize that we need to renew our minds and start thinking differently, we understand that the ways of God is foolishness to the people of this world. So it might be foolishness to say that it's perverse to complain, but literally it is based on the word of God. Yes. And they understood it, which is why they began to praise. They began to worship because they understand that my circumstance does not determine who I am. What I'm going through does not have the power to dictate who I am and how I'm going to feel in this emotion. Did you know that in this situation, did you know that joy is actually a character? It's actually something that you can embody. We look at it like it's a feeling. But when we read Galatians 5, it tells us about the fruits of the Spirit. And the fruits of the Spirit talks about the character of Jesus Christ. And it mentions joy, which means that joy must be who he is. And if you're going to see his glory and become it, that means you can actually become joy. And now the beauty of, of becoming joy is that when you become joy, whatever you may face, will not take away what you've become. You can't, yeah. you can't, you can't be something and something now, of, like I'm a, I'm a man, I'm a guy. Yeah. No matter what I face, I will remain a guy. Yeah. So if you become joy, no matter what you face, you will remain joy. That's right. Nothing will take that away from you. Yeah. And because that's what they be, that's what they became, they still saw a reason to praise and they still saw a reason to worship because they've literally become joy. And how did God respond? God shook up the foundations of the prisons, opened up the prison doors, and they had every reason to escape. But this is where I'm going. The God that kept them in chains was about to literally kill himself. But how did Paul respond? At this time, this was his enemy. This is how Paul responded. Paul ran to him and said, stop it. Don't kill yourself or still hate. Literally, and he took them in, and he took the guard in, and they decided when they could have had a free escape to run out, they all literally stayed in. And the mercy of God hit this man. The love of God hit this man. He was like, wait, you had the opportunity to run away. Like, you, are, you had the opportunity to, to have me kill myself. I'm the one who imprisoned you. But you're going to have this level of mercy on me. You're going to have this level of grace on me. You're going to have this level of compassion on me. He dropped down on his knees and said, what must I do to be saved? Notice, Paul didn't say a thing to him about yeah, Jesus. Paul showed him mercy. Paul showed him compassion. Paul didn't say what he showed him, Jesus. And that was enough to bring him to his knees and repent. And him and his own um, household got baptized and they received Christ. That's the, that's the power of mercy. That's the power of kindness. That's the power of forgiveness. Literally, that is the power. Now, Paul begin, becomes someone who has now, is now going to actually extend that which he has received. You know, he's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's delivering. He's doing all these things. The reality is Matthew 28. Don't get me wrong. Because I'm saying show the gospel doesn't mean you still shouldn't tell people about the gospel. Because Christ has actually told you to do it. Matthew 28 says, go, go out and make the Sabbath for all nations. Amen. You know? And Mark 16 says that go and preach the gospel to all creation, which means you have to use your mouth. Yeah. And it talks about us. And he says that whoever believes, you know, whoever receives you, they will believe and signs will follow them. 
out of the signs, he said, they shall cast out devils. You know, they shall speak in new tongues. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. When we look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, we understand something profound. We understand that to Jesus, it wasn't enough for his apostles and his disciples to just go and say, Christ resurrected. Because if that was enough, there wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a need for them to tarry. There wouldn't have been a need for them to stay. He said, stay in Jerusalem and don't leave until I baptize you with the Holy Spirit and power. Why? Because rather than you telling people that I've resurrected, rather than you telling people about the gospel, you are going to demonstrate it in power. This is why you need the promise of the Father. Because if I've resurrected, this has severe implications. This means that, you know, death has no power anymore. Sickness has no power anymore. Disease has no power anymore. Addictions have no power anymore. Like they were powerful, but because I've resurrected, I show that I am more powerful than these things. And your lives have to demonstrate it. It has to be a reality in your life, and then it's going to be a reality through your life. I've delivered you. I've set you free. I've made you whole. I've completely, you know, delivered you. And now I'm going to be deliverer, savior, healer through you. And I'm going to share some testimonies to give this some context. Um, Pastor Cab was talking earlier about how we shouldn't live a life, you know, of survival, like we were surviving. We need to live a life of victory. I'm going to share what my week has been like, just to show what's possible when we're in the glory. Just to show what's possible when we're in the presence, when we're intimate, because before I go there, this is how to be intimate with Christ. It's basic. And we all know it. We all know the basis of Christianity. We all know we need a relationship with the Word of God. We need a relationship with prayer. We need a relationship with worship. And we need to give ourselves to these things daily. We need to give ourselves to these things daily. Because it's in those things that we actually create the atmosphere for encounter. We create the atmosphere to actually see God's glory. Because when we see it, then we become it. Yes? No. Cool. So, the other day I was actually going, um, I was coming back from the library because, well, that was a testimony I had, but I was waiting to get on the, to, you know, to, to give the sermon to share it. But, but by the grace of God, I finished university, I just gave him thanks, I gave him glory, started to go through it. So, yeah. But whilst I was still in uni, um, a Muslim cab driver was, was, you know, came to pick me up and God speaks to me about the pain that he had literally on the lower, lower part of his hip. And I asked him, do you have a pain right here by any chance? And he said, yes. So I said, would you allow me to pray for you? And he allowed me. So I laid my hands, just, I just held his hands actually. And I just prayed that, you know, he'd be delivered, he'd be set free, he'd be made whole. Just a simple prayer. And I said, how's he feeling? He said, you know, he's going to check it. Um, and then... I said, okay, cool, take my number, call me tomorrow, see how you're feeling. He said he usually afflicts him at night, you know, when he's sleeping and stuff. So the next day, he called, I call him, and he tells me that, you know, he slept with ease. He slept yeah. with complete ease. And then I began to share with him about how, you know, it's Jesus that healed you. It's not Allah. It's Jesus. You see, now when I'm witnessing about Jesus, because, I'm dem because I've demonstrated his power, is more likely to hear what I have to say. Yeah. And the reality is we all have access. Because the Bible says these signs shall follow those that believe. Are you a believer? Yeah. Are you qualified? Yeah. It's supposed to follow you. I understand that there's giftings, yes. But just because someone may be gifted with mercy, because they need mercy to like maybe... Um, run homeless shelters and, and, and charities and stuff like that. Just because they're gifted with mercy, because that's their calling, doesn't mean that because that's not your calling, you can't still show mercy. Mm -hmm. Just because Benny Hinn has a healing ministry doesn't mean you can't walk in healing. Come on. It's the same thing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. And then another tab journey, I told this cab driver Jesus loves you because, you know, a good way to start is just literally telling people that Jesus loves them. And I tell him Jesus loves him, and he was like, 
I picked you up before. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it was like about six months ago, five months ago, somewhere around that, um, that time frame. I said, did I pray for you? He said, yeah. He said, did I, I said, did I pray for your healing? He said, yeah. He said, I prayed for his back. Um, and it disappeared. And six months later, it's not come back. And I was like, I actually got him to do a video. And I was, and I was like, do you see that? Jesus loves you. And then I start preaching about Jesus to him. Like, we can't save people, but we plant seeds. Yeah. Paul may plant, but Paul doesn't make water, but God gives the increase. Yeah. So every, every demonstration of his love, every dem demonstration of his character, every demonstration of his power, and every demonstration of you preaching the gospel is you adding to that seed or water in it. And if there's no seed, if there's no water in it, what's God going to give the increase to? Nothing. Come on, that's right. And understand what I've done here. I started with character, his mercy, his, 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 his own kindness, his forgiveness. And now I'm talking about power because it's not okay to walk in power but have no character. Come on. Yes. In the same way, character is supposed to produce power because power is in the character of God. We have to be, we have to be complete. How did Jesus demonstrate it? How did Jesus live it out? He had compassion that produced healing. He had compassion that produced miracles. And he's the model of what it means to reveal the Father. He said, he said to Philip in John 14, Philip was saying, where's the Father? Show us the Father. But Jesus said, have I not been with you like long enough? Like, don't you understand that when you look at me, you've seen the Father? Yeah. You know, like, I'm standing here right here, I'm an ambassador, I'm a representative of the Father. You, everything you need to know about the Father, you know when you look at me. Yeah. Let me give you an illustration so that it makes sense to you. John 15 says that I am the vine and my Father is the gardener. I want to ask you a question. When you look at a garden that's perfectly cultivated and beautiful, by looking at that garden, you know everything you need to know about the garden. You don't need to see the gardener to know what you need to know about the garden. Yeah. Because you see the garden's work, you see the work of the garden, and you understand what the garden is like. Yeah. That's why Jesus said, the works I do testify. They testify of themselves. They actually testify of who I am. They testify that I've been sent of the Father, by the Father. Yeah. So when you look at me, you actually see the Father. Yeah. And then he says, Whoever believes in me, greater works you will do. You know, you will do the same thing that I do, but you will even do greater works because I go to the Father. What's that work? That work is actually revealing the Father. It's actually glorifying him, his character and his power. You know, I'm speaking about healings and I'm speaking about how they help you to actually, you know, preach the gospel and stuff. But sometimes you don't even have to rely on it. There's a testimony that Nia had quite recently where she was sitting by a gym and she sees a random guy and she tells him that Jesus loves him. A simple Jesus loves him. And he left and then he comes back and says that, you know, he's always known that God was real, but he's an atheist, like he was born into an atheist family. But her speaking to him right then was all he needed to know and to understand that you know, Jesus is real, and he asked if he can come to her church the Sunday. And then he followed her to church on that Sunday, and he gave his life to Christ there and there. A simple, Jesus loves you. I'm telling you, I say Jesus loves you to most people when I walk on the street. A lot of them probably swear at me, a lot of people probably cut their eye at me, a lot of people probably don't care. But for that one that it makes their day, every, every of that is worth it. Every single one of it is worth it. But when you are living for yourself, you're not going to think like that. When you're self-seeking, you're actually not going to think like that. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Another nature he's, 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 he's even prompting me to speak about is how much, you know, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave. So there's something about giving that reveals his nature. I actually had an interesting encounter on my way here where I was literally coming here and I see a man and he asks me um, if I'm from Ghana. I was like, no, I'm Nigerian, but a lot of people um, think I'm from Ghana. Apparently I'm Ghanaian. I don't even know what that means. But, um, 
But, um, and then I said, I'm actually on my way to go, you know, preach. He was like, oh, so you're a pastor. Then he tells me his own situation. He tells me about how he walked his wife, you know, to the, to, um, the, the airport because she was going to Ghana, but he lost his wallet. He lost everything he has, and now he's stranded, but he needs money to get to Northampton because he works as a nurse for the NHS. Um, so, he, so he was like, Pastor, can you pray for me? He was pastor. I was like, I'm not a pastor. <laughs> but was, I was like, you know, I was like, can you pray for me and stuff? And then he actually asked me, I know that, you know, you know, James actually says, what good is it when you see a person in need and you say, be well, what the need, the, the goods that he needs, you don't yeah. actually offer yeah, yeah. So, I can pray for you, cool, but I can do better because my father is a giver and I'm going to reveal his nature. So I, I took out some money and I blessed him. Now, a lot of people might say, you know, how do you know he's not taking advantage of you? How do you know he didn't lie? How do you know he didn't cook it up? He could have. But the worst that happened to me was I lost the money I lost. But he could actually be telling the truth. And what happened is he found a way to get where he's going. I don't care if he took advantage of me because I'm not living for me anymore. I'm living to fulfill his nature. So the world doesn't think like this. That's why we need to renew our minds with the word of God by looking at the example Christ did so that we can be holy. Holiness is not you biting your lip and trying to be holy. Holiness actually comes from intimacy with Jesus. Holiness comes from a renewed mind because it means that now you're thinking differently from the way the world thinks and now you're distinct. You're actually set apart. But it comes from the way you think. It literally comes from the way you think. I'll share one more testimony. Um, I don't know how much time I have left. I don't even know how I'm doing. Okay, cool. Um, still on the subject of giving. I remember this testimony. I think it's one of my favorite testimonies because it, it, it actually preaches the gospel. Um, I was supposed to, I was actually really like stupid to do what I did. Like I needed to, um, what do you call it? I needed to book tickets to come, to go from Manchester to London, where I accidentally booked London to Manchester. So I lost about 40 pounds trying to book that ticket. And when I got to the train ticket, to the, to the, to the train, when I got to the ticket, trying to take out the money, then I clocked, oh my gosh, what have I done? But I was with my friend, and my friend was like, you know, let's go through town to go home. I was like, cool. I wasn't, you know, I was thinking for myself then and there. I was just like, ah, oh, I just lost this money. What am I doing? But I was like, you know what, cool, let's go. And whilst we were going, um, just decided to, you know, tell people that Jesus loves them along the way. The reality is that you're not going to evangelize every day. You probably know you're busy. You've got work. You are probably at a school. You're a student, whatever. You've got, a, like, you're not going to go out to evangelize every day. But you're probably going to leave your house every day. And you're probably going to see people every day. So there's an opportunity to just say a simple Jesus loves you as you go about your day. Yeah. You don't, you, I promise you, it can save a soul. You have no idea. I've seen it make people's days. Yeah. Literally. Wow. So I tell some people, we're going. I just had a bad, you know, you can tell I was having a bad day. But I see this man selling CDs, me and my friend, and we go, Jesus loves you. And then straight away from his countenance, everything you can just tell about oh, this person. It's just like, he doesn't want to hear it about Jesus. Then he starts asking questions. If Jesus is this, why is this? Why am I here on the street? Why has my family done this? Blah, blah, blah. And whilst he was talking, Holy Spirit tells me to bless him. And when, I, when he says bless him, I know he means financially. And I'm thinking, Holy Spirit, did you not just realize I just lost it? <laughs> you know I just lost it. <laughs> but I'm going to obey you. I go, take out money. And I bless him, and his countenance changes straight away. Now he, he, he wanted to listen to everything we had to say, and we preached and preached and preached the gospel to him, and he gave his life to Christ then and there. Yeah. Nothing preaches the gospel better than selflessness. Yes, yes, come okay, on. Cool. I promise this will be the last one. <laughs> Because it literally just came back to me. I forgot the significance of it. This actually happened yesterday. I was supposed to come up for evangelism, uh, but my parents' church had a youth program, and 
I felt that the Lord really wanted me to be there. And we're about to reveal why. So, um, you understand that not only prophets hear God, hear God's voice. Not only prophetic people hear God's voice. You know, all believers hear God's voice. Because Jesus said, my sheep will hear and obey my voice. If you're a sheep, you have to have access to his voice. You're, to, you're supposed to be able to hear it. So, I was just there, you know, we were rehearsing, we were having our rehearsals and everything. And um, God begins to speak to me about this guy. He was very musically gifted, you know, he was just really good with the keys, piano, and everything. But God was telling me that he actually has a prophetic gift, a prophetic calling. And I was like, okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, trying to say it to him, but I was like, you know what, let's go off to the side and let's, let me pray for you and hear what God has to say. So, so as I prayed, God revealed issues, all of all sorts, and I was just, you know, just releasing God's word, what God had to say about it. But little did I know that whilst we were praying, God was actually showing him visions. So God was showing, God showed him visions of three different crosses of, of fire and, and and all of them, I started to explain to him that that's the fire of revival. God's actually going to use you as a revivalist. Talking to him about Ezekiel 37, can these dry bones live? And, God, and Ezekiel prophesying and the dry bones coming to life. Just declaring all of that onto him. And I asked him, you know, do you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? Like, and he said, yes. Why? Because prophecy edifies, exhausts, and comforts. Yeah. You know, we need to be a people who have access to the voice of God because when we tell people about what's in their heart, when we tell people about their gifts and their callings, when we tell people about what they've been created to do, you know, when we tell people the things that they've gone through, when we get a word of knowledge about someone, Jesus is real. Amen. Like, he's alive. He knows you. He knows you better than you know yourself. Amen. And because of that, he decided to get saved. The Bible tells us, you know, there's this sort of evangelistic culture where we where we um, make converts, but we don't make disciples. Mm. Matthew said, make disciples, not converts. Amen. When you preach the gospel, disciple them. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take your phone number. I'm going to take everything. I'm going to I'm actually going to disciple you. And and um, there was church today at my parents' church. So after that, it's quite sometimes I may feel like a prompt to ask people if they need prayers for healing for whatnot they should come so that was the case a few people came to me for healing but then i was like you know what he just received christ which means the holy spirit lives in him mm -hmm. which means he's now a believer which means the sign will follow him yeah. so i take him along with me and i was like you know what you lay hands i'm not gonna bring you lay hands and he laid hands on a man with with with, with um knees with, with bad knees and gets healed. He, he laid hands on a woman that's, you know, that was kind of deaf on one ear, and we went back and tested it, and was shouting, you know, just kind of saying, shouting words that as you could hear was perfectly. If this is someone who has just received Christ the, the day before, and he's stepping out, demonstrating that Christ is real, what is the excuse of us who have been saved for like 20 years, 30 years, we really need to step out of faith. And sometimes it could be down to, we just don't know what we have access to. And that's the beauty of testimonies. A testimony actually means do it again. It's root word actually means do it again. So when testimonies are being shared, we're creating the atmosphere for God to duplicate that which is already done. So as I'm sharing these testimonies, the angels of God, the spirit of God is going to enforce it and make it rea a reality in the lives of you guys that are here. I believe that with all my heart. That's why the Bible says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. It's prophetic in nature. That makes sense. So in essence, just to round up everything that I've said so far, is that in order to preach the gospel, in order to live a lifestyle that preaches the gospel, we need to come we are people that experience God's glory. And we experience God's glory through understanding our identity as brides. Mm -hmm. Because a bride is one with a husband. A son reveals his father. And understanding your identity as a bride, brides know that they're loved. Did you know John's secret? John's secret, John wasn't the most loved disciple. He was the one who understood that he was loved. And because he understood that he was loved, that allowed him to know that he could come close. That's why he's the one that would always have his head by Jesus' bosom. He's the one that pressed him closer. Why? Because he knew he was loved. Amen. 
So when you know you are loved, when you know you're a bride, when you know you're not a concubine, when you know you're a son, it brings you to that place of intimacy where you want to be close to him. And when you're close to him, he begins to put his seed in you. Think of yourself as a bride. He begins to put his nature in you, his seed in you, his fruit in you, everything in you, and pregnates you with who he is that you give birth to it in the world. I hope that made sense. And whilst that happens through reading the word, through praying, through fasting, and making a lifestyle of these things, we see his glory. And as we see his glory, we become it. We become a people that display his character, his love, his compassion, his mercy, his kindness, his goodness, his gentleness, his faithfulness, his self-control. We become a people that out of his character we're also producing his power, his power to heal, his power to deliver, his power to prophesy, his power to cast out devils, his power to do all of those things. And it results to a lifestyle of seeing people come to Christ, seeing people repent, seeing people turn from their sins. You know, you plant those seeds, you water them, but God always gives the increase. We also have to be a people who intercedes for souls to be saved as well. In the secret place, there's a place for that as well. So I'm going to leave you with this, guys. You are his bride. You are his son. You are his daughter. Come close. When you come close, you see his glory. When you see his glory, you become it. And then you display it to the world around you, and it brings people to Christ. Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Come on, church. Let's give him a little round of applause. Wow. Praise the Lord. Were you blessed today, Amen? Yes. Amen. Yeah, did you get what he was saying? Yes. Praise the Lord. Thank you. If you're in need of any sort of ministration to do with healing or if you have any body parts, um, it, it, it doesn't even have to be physical because whilst I was there in worship, I felt that there was maybe people um, having struggles with their mind, things surrounding that area. So if that applies to you, any sort of physical um, pains, could be your legs, whatever, or something um, affecting you with your mind, just literally come to the front and we'll just pray for you. This is Sword of the Spirit International Prophetic Ministries.
ready for miracles to explode in your life. David E. Taylor welcomes you to the 2017 Miracle Crusade. All sicknesses can be eradicated by the government of God. I don't care what it is, that sickness is going to die in the presence of God. I had a lump and it's gotten bigger and it was tight and hard and huge. It's gone. It's completely gone. Experience the power of God. If anybody step foot in this building or around this ministry, they're going to see Jesus. They're going to get healed. They're going to get miracles. And when the kingdom of God comes down here, cancer is healed. AIDS is healed. Diabetes is healed. Sickness is destroyed. If you have some type of cyst or growth of cancer in your body, it's going to die tonight. Join David E. Taylor for the Miracle Crusade in London, England, July 6th through the 9th, 1 Marsh Road, Alperton, London, HAO 1ES. Thor of the Spirit International Prophetic Ministries. Call now to reserve your free seat today. 1877 The Glory. That's 1877 843 4567. This is Sword of the Spirit International Prophetic Ministries. Look back at me wherever I go. Why worry? Moses I focus ranking. on the problem when I have the solution. That represented his mantle. Prophetess Kevin ranking. What God was going to do in his life. How God was going to set him apart from the rest of his brothers. Come worship with us Sundays 5pm, Thursdays 8pm. We're located at 1 Marsh Road, Alperton, London, HA01ES.